Good evening and welcome. I'm Phil Curry, a member of the Friends of the First Amendment Society, which is a group of New Museum supporters, as many of you know. And recently I was privileged to become chair of the new advisory council to the Friends Society. From that vantage point, I've learned more about the extensive variety of museum programs and practices that makes this such an important and special place. The program tonight is an excellent example of the benefits of the museum membership, especially as the program coordinates with the terrific permanent exhibit. The Berlin Wall exhibit, which some of you may have seen during the reception there, with the largest number of wall pieces outside of Berlin, shows so clearly the difference between freedom and oppression. <clears throat> the uh, west side of the wall, as you probably saw, you find vivid colors, words, and graphics put there by free people, including, I noticed, a message that says, act up. On the east side, where free expression was stifled or forbidden, you see only bare, bland concrete joined by a threatening guard tower. As you watch the accompanying powerful videos featuring the authoritative reporting of Tom Brokaw, you see how the freedom triumphed as the wall literally and symbolically came down 25 years ago. That's the exhibit. But underscoring the kind of perspective that the museum so often provides, we will hear tonight from Tom Brokaw, one of the premier newsmen of our time and the very person who was at the wall to report on those events as they happened. You also will get a deeper look at his rich and broad career. Nothing illustrates better the museum's significant role in bringing us both the story and the people who experienced it, a compelling combination of world history and contemporary perspective. The museum frequently presents such combinations. This blend is one of the many reasons I'm so high on the organization and have joined with so many of you in membership. Through, through the support of the Press Pass and Friends Society members, the museum can continue its high quality programs, its excellent exhibits, its exceptional educational work, and its visible and valuable commitment to the five freedoms of the First Amendment. And members are our best partners and advocates in championing the precious freedoms that strengthen our democracy. So I join everyone associated with the museum in thanking you profusely for all that you do and in encouraging you to continue your partnership with us. I hope you'll even consider deepening your engagement by introducing your friends and colleagues to our work, visiting our exhibits, exploring other levels of membership, or joining me as a member of the Friends Society. Any or all of these can make this a special relationship with the museum and the First Amendment freedoms and make it a stronger and more lasting bond. And with that, it's now my pleasure to introduce Peter Pritchard, chairman of the museum, who will introduce our program with Tom Brokaw and Luke Resser. Thank you. Way too generous. You ought to save that for Ty McCoy, frankly, uh, for next <laughs> Sunday. That's what I think. I, I was going to suggest that Tom quit now. Could be over. <laughs> Is there anybody here from South Dakota? Yeah, yeah. yeah a couple people. <laughs> All right, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, from Yankton. Well, that's cool. Um, I, I want to join Phil in uh, thanking uh, all of our Press Pass members, our Friends of the First Amendment Society, and our ever faithful donors to this members only event. It's your loyal support that makes programs like this possible. And I'd also like to welcome all of our new members, and we look forward to seeing many of you at events in the future. I also want to take a moment to thank Dan Dionisio and Tim Mulligan, our stellar investment advisors at Goldman Sachs, for helping us build such a good and interesting crowd tonight. 
And we're also lucky that our interviewer tonight is one of the best young journalists in Washington, Luke Russert. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Luke uh, covers Capitol Hill for NBC News. He's also a regular contributor to MSNBC and to Meet the Press. And he even co-hosts a sports radio show with James Carville, <laughs> of all people, on, on uh, Sirius XM called And I agreed to do this for free also. So. <laughs> I'm glad he pointed it's that out. It's the most important thing. Luke is a faithful museum member and supporter, as was his father. I'm sure all of you know many of the essential facts about Tom Brokaw. He has worked at NBC since 1966. He covered Watergate as their White House correspondent. He was host of the Today Show for six years. He was anchor and managing editor of NBC Nightly News for 12 years during what was certainly the golden age of network news. Over his long and illustrious career, he has covered most of the blockbuster stories of the past 50 years. Watergate, the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is nearing its 25th anniversary, and the disputed Bush-Gore presidential election. And he's the author of five best-selling books, of which the best known may be The Greatest Generation. But here are a few facts that some of you might not know. He grew up near the Black Hills and lived in the small towns of Bristol and Igloo, South Dakota, before settling in the metropolis of Yankton. <laughs> he, he has been married for 52 years now to a great woman, M Meredith Alba. Yeah, we <clears throat> A former Miss South Dakota. <laughs> he dropped out of the University of Iowa he said once, because he was majoring, in his words, in beer and co-eds. <laughs> but he later graduated from the University of South Dakota, our founder, Al Newharth's alma mater. And now he has received 30 honorary degrees. They fill up a whole page on the bio. <laughs> he owns a big ranch in Montana, and he's an avid hunter, backpacker, and fisherman. NBC Nightly was number one in the ratings for eight years when he was the anchor, and he was widely regarded as the most popular news personality in the nation. And finally, here are three Tom Brokaw quotes you may not have heard. On retirement, I'm not going to sit on the porch of the old anchorman's home with a drool cup. <laughs> on his hobby, if fishing is a religion, Fly fishing is high church. <laughs> On life, it's easy to make a buck. It's a lot tougher to make a difference. I think you can understand why we feel so lucky to have Tom here at the museum tonight to share some stories from what can only be described as a stellar career. So Luke, take it away. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Peter, and most importantly, thank you to all of you for coming out and supporting this wonderful institution. I, uh, it's my favorite museum in Washington. I might be a little bit biased because my father helped found it. Uh, but when you walk in here and you see the First Amendment plastered to the wall that can be seen from the Capitol, and it's so very important that we come here to celebrate the role of the press and, and the Fourth Estate, uh, and I think the fourth estate is less popular than HMOs right now and oil companies in some polls. <laughs> but I promise the new generation is trying to, do, uh, trying to do better on that. But let's talk to a living legend, as I like to say, Tom Brokaw, who if you ever mention Tom Brokaw, you'll meet some people that say, I woke up with Tom Brokaw every morning over breakfast of the Today Show. Or I ate dinner with Tom Brokaw every night. Uh, on NBC Nightly News, and that was what I sort of was. I grew up that. It was Tom Brokaw at the dinner table every single night along with my mom and dad, and it was just so great to get all types of stories and just an instant history lesson at any time. We're approaching the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. I did some research today. You were the only network news anchor there, the only broadcast. The West Germans did not have time to get set up live. Um, amazing backstory about how all that happened. But you took it upon yourself to go over there while there were midterm elections going on, because uh, the belief that this could be the bigger story. And you went to a press conference where the propaganda minister from East Germany 
said these things, you had an interview with them. I want to play that right now. Can we do that? And we'll go into the question. <laughs> oh, that was an amazing moment. I'm, I'm going to do two things. It's the first time I've ever been interviewed by someone who I first saw on a sonogram. <laughs> There you go. Tim came to me and said, I'm going to have a son. And here is the proof of that. And it was a thrilling moment for everybody. And I'm so proud of how Luke has continued the legacy of his dad. And with his, with his mother, Maureen, he's, a, he's become a cherished, not only surrogate nephew, but also a great, great journalist. So I'm thrilled to be on the stage with him. And I know that Tim is looking down and says to us, go get them. Yes, tonight, indeed, so indeed. Yeah, Thank you. A couple of things about that at the beginning. Shabowski didn't know what the hell he was talking about, it turns out. <laughs> he had been given this note. It was at the end of a news conference, and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the Politburo on the other side had a lot of restrictions on how people could go back and forth through the wall. He read it, not quite knowing what he was saying. And of course, that was broadcast across East Germany, so people did go to all the exit barriers and start pushing back. And there was a lot of confusion. As we went on the air, we had not yet gotten a video of people who were going through one of the other uh, exits. So we, were, we needed to show that immediately. The, uh, the water cannon didn't work very well. They, the guards on the other side didn't quite know what to do. But at one point, they did drive everybody off, except one man who stood with his back to the water cannon, leather jacket, his arms outstretched, big grin on his face. And I said to my producer, go get him and bring him back. He's the face of the new liberated East Germany. And my producer came back about 10 seconds later, doubled over and laughed. He said, not what we think. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, he's a drunk. He's been living over here in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> and he hasn't had a shower in two weeks. So he's, he's very grateful for what's going on. But that was the beginning of the fall of the wall. And it was the symbolic end of communism, obviously as the controlling factor in the satellite states and the Soviet Union was coming unraveled at the same time. I'm a child of the Cold War. I grew up studying and thinking about it, about what kind of a world we're going to have. And when that happened, I have two really reactions to it. One is it was a liberation the likes of which we had never seen before. And a lot of people didn't expect it to happen until the 21st century. And I don't think that the West then reacted in a way that they might have. I, I've just gotten back from Berlin and Germany. I was there with Dr. Kissinger and Jim Baker at the American Academy, and we talked about this. It was not the kind of effort that should have been made to say, how else can we use NATO? NATO was our Western alliance, remains that, but it has kind of come unraveled around the edges. It's not as unified as it once was, and it was an incredibly important and, and, and potent force in, facing the East and dealing with issues together, and not always perfectly, but it was the alliance. Now it has a lot of parts to it, and they're often not greater than the sum of their, of their parts, which they need to be. The other part of what we were watching there tonight was that it was so thrilling and hard to explain about how the dramatic people who had had such a terrible 20th century, mostly self-induced wounds, then were divided, and you'd have people in the West who had cousins in the East. The people in the West had democracy and consumer goods and, and hope. And when the wall came down, their cousins and the other fellow Germans came through in acid wash jeans, two cycle Lottas and Trahant automobiles <laughs> as if they had come from the moon to Venus. Wow. They just couldn't believe what they were seeing. And so it was one of the most dramatic events, I think, of the 20th century in a kind of a 24-hour period, and then it went on from there. There was a big debate about whether Germany should be reunited politically. Uh, much later, I was presiding at a conference in, um, in Atlanta organized by a Coca-Cola corporate lawyer. We had Gorbachev, President Bush 41, and Helmut Kohl. And Helmut Kohl got up, big bear of a guy, got quite emotional, got tears in his eyes, and he turned to Gorbachev and he said, you did not send the tanks. And that gave us a chance to be a whole country again. And he turned to President Bush and he said, and you stood for unification when others, including Margaret Thatcher, said we have to keep them divided. And it was one of those moments in history when you saw three men with courage and vision 
to come together and they were so personal in their interaction and it kind of gave me hope and we, we don't see a lot of that anymore. One amazing thing in that newscast, aside from you being the only broadcast anchor there, uh, a huge win for NBC News, if there ever was one, probably our biggest one in history, is I was reading a sort of breakdown by, by the EP at the time, Bill Wheatley, and he goes, you asked for about 15 to 20 seconds at the end of the newscast to give a little essay, uh, put it in the context of history. Why was that important for you to do at that time, and how did you come up with that in the commercial break, is how it was described. Well, there were two things that happened. First of all, it was such chaos. I couldn't hear myself. And by the way, I was very well dressed, in part because I had gone over there with my, one of my typical kind of raggedy outdoor jackets. I thought, this is going to be on take for a long time. One of my colleagues had just bought a smashing top coat in London. He said, give me the top coat. So I'm there in the, I'm there in the blue top coat. And, and then I, I just said to the control room in uh, New York, I'm going to have to have lips this. I'm just going to have to get through it the best I can. You'll know when I'm going to call for video. And then when we were doing this special later, I thought, we have to put this in some kind of context. And the context for me was, I always thought that 1968 would be the defining year of, of my career. 1968, Lyndon Johnson stepped aside. We lost 16,000 people in Vietnam. Bobby and Gene McCarthy were running against each other for the Democratic nomination. Dr. King was assassinated, Bobby Kennedy was murdered, we had the Chicago riots, the Miami Convention nominated Richard Nixon, George Wallace was also running, and we had that very heated election that fall. People also forget that at the end of that year, a man stepped on the moon. So that was a very, very rich year. And then I traced some of that, and then I began to talk about what we've been witnessing in 1989, which was the rearrangement of the world, if you will, which included China. Uh, I was also in Tiananmen Square that year and in Czechoslovakia and in Poland. I was in Russia. I had interviewed Gorbachev in 87 and persuaded him for a couple of years. I was the only American journalist he should ever talk to. And then I was <laughs> caught up to that. So I, I, what I did was say, we have to put this in a context so people can understand the warp speed at which the world is changing. In our present day, the main adversaries the U.S. faces is really Islamic radicals and Islamic fundamentalists, and it's really changed how we cover the story because right now a lot of news organizations can't get into Syria, uh, can't get into parts of Iraq because of it's so dangerous. So the story has really changed, and it's not as clear cut as it used to be. It's not that it's the United States versus the Soviet Union and sort of satellite proxy wars up there. You have all these sort of tribal wars playing out in the Middle East. What's important for media consumer to digest from A, how we're trying to do our best over there in terms of getting the story out, and what does it mean sort of for future generations that the prolonged conflict in that part of the world in sort of a guerrilla style, not only through newer technologies, uh, but also through radical religious ideologies, really will be sort of my generation's, seems, defining global struggle. Uh, you've touched, I think, on the critical issue uh, about where we go forward from here and our national security uh, considerations. We are still locked in, even those of us who are journalists who should know better, to the idea of nation-state confrontations, that it will be between the East and the West, or it will be between Russia and the United States. And as I said, I was in Berlin with Kissinger and Baker, and, and Kissinger said, you know, when the wall came down, when communism ended, we could have anticipated what would happen in the satellite states. We could have anticipated even the rise of somebody like Putin we didn't see what was going to happen in the Middle East. And what we have in the Middle East now, of course, is not just asymmetrical warfare to deal with, in which we have these highly trained, extraordinarily motivated, radical Islamic forces that are moving easily, too easily in my judgment, across that part of the world. They all came out of artificial states, the states that were designed after World War I. The tribal culture is what defines them and it's faith-based in, in most instances, and it goes very deep and it's been there for a long time. And when you're there with them, uh, and it, not just with the militia, but with the people in the streets of the various cities, that's the first thing that they refer to. Um, and the one place that they close up on, you can be a, talking to a Shiite and you can be talking to a Sunni, and they'll have extraordinarily stark differences. But then you talk to them about the West coming in and they close up and they say, this is our world. You can't tell us how to live here. 
And that's what we have. We have not yet, in my judgment, dealt with the culture. We don't get it yet because we have such an indifferent, imp a different impression in the Western culture about how life should be lived. You cannot overstate uh, the faith-based motivation that they have. And it's ancient and it's narrow and we have a hard time understanding it, but it is a hugely motivational force and it leads to the kind of radical, unspeakable behavior that we've been witnessing of beheading journalists and they think that they're doing it in the name of their faith. There's nowhere in the Quran that says you've got to behead somebody who doesn't necessarily agree with you, especially innocent people. I, I, I think the, the hard problem for us is that we don't have that part of the world. We don't understand it as well as we need to, and we're losing what allies we had. I, you know, one of the things that I said recently is, how do we deal with ISIL or ISIS, however you care to characterize it? I said, I like to take a lot of those idle, rich young men that I see when I go to Saudi Arabia wandering through shopping centers, put them in uniform, and make them the special forces. Because the king is saying, well, it's up to the West now. You know, it's, it's up to everybody. This is a, a deeply dangerous situation. And moving into the political sphere, it's going to define President Obama's presidency in many ways. Part of the success of the new forms of radical Islam is really based upon their skillful use of new media, uh, completely bypassing any of the traditional yep. forms. And even to some degree, their success in the United States has been, in, in terms of recruiting people, has been, doing, has, has been in that manner. What has surprised you the most about the sort of new media age we live in? And we all talk about how the barriers are now being blown away that used to exist. Uh, it's more free in some ways, but that freedom also brings with it a lot of liabilities. Well, I think it's good news and bad news. I, I do think that during Arab Spring, Twitter was an, a very powerful instrument for people to stay connected who were in the streets and trying to, uh, and not, not just to start a revolt, but try to have uh, an end of the revolt. My issue with it, with the social media, is that it allows almost no reflective time, that you, you don't have a chance to stop, think, and have a real dialogue. It's, you know, it's just 140, so, I mean, 140 characters or whatever it happens to be, bang, bang, bang. And we don't know the sourcing of it. I mean, it could be some guy in his underwear who couldn't get a date, you know, <laughs> sitting there, and, he, and he's giving the impression that he has hundreds of thousands of followers and saying anything that is outrageous that comes to his or her mind. And I'm telling you that in the Middle East and the, um, and the jihadist camps and other places, they're ahead of a lot of where we are in terms of that's how they communicate. And they stay in touch with each other. And if something happens here, bang, it's all out over there. I said something on Meet the Press a year ago, right after the Boston Marathon bombing, in which I said, I think we have to re-examine, uh, re-examine was my phrase, we have to re-examine our drone policies, because if you hit one innocent in a village, then that rockets around the Middle East on all the social media sites. And uh, you know, Bill O'Reilly, among others, came after me hard, saying, oh, he just wants to fold up, and, and you know, he's the guy who wrote about the greatest generation, and sometimes there has to be collateral to enemy. I wasn't saying we stop. But we had it, and I also knew that what was going on at the intelligence agencies and the military, they were concerned about the impact of drone attacks and knocking down doors. So almost everything you do over there has consequences of some kind. And we're fighting a, a war the likes of which we've never fought before. And it's very hard, and we're now in our third war. Well, uh, another area we can turn to that seems to be constant war is American politics these days. Uh, but you're so good at having a historical context uh, put forward for all of us in terms of what you've seen and what you've heard. I want you to go back to about 14 years ago, election night 2000, <laughs> closest election in history. Florida had gone to Al Gore. It had then been taken out of his column and gone to George W. Bush then taken out of his calm, the 25 very precious electoral votes. We're going to run the tape about how it looked 14 years ago. I actually remember this like it was yesterday because it was a defining moment in my household, but let's take a look. <laughs> <laughs> what the networks give us, the networks taketh away. NBC <laughs> News is now taking Florida out of Vice President Gore's column. It's just far too confusing. We're about to make an official call. It's just too confusing. Florida has been in play all night long. It has not been a sterling evening for vote projections in that state. Uh, originally, uh, NBC News and all the other networks projected that Al Gore would win Florida. 
than at 2.18 this morning. We project. <laughs> All right, we're officially saying that Florida is too close to call because <laughs> of a recall. They need Florida. Florida, Florida, Florida. Let me show you one more time, Tom. This is it, right here. Florida, <laughs> Florida, Florida, Florida. Florida, Florida, Florida. <laughs> it's that kind of night. It, uh, or morning. It is indeed. <laughs> And it was that kind of night, and then we went all the way to the Supreme Court uh, case that happened in December that ultimately decided... Your dad and I came out of the same court. gene pool, as you know. We were Absolutely. both working class kids. We loved politics. We'd grown up with it. At one point, when I first met Big Russ, your grandfather, he got out of a car. We were waiting. I was waiting for him at a baseball game, and Tim had gotten a car to drive him out there, and Big Russ got out of the car and said, my limo driver was late. It was this great line. And... I thought that's exactly what my dad would have said. I mean, you know, where's my limo driver? You know, I got these kids that got limos. And we were joined at the hip, the two of us. And I still, especially at this time of the year, I want to punch his number in and, and say, hey, what do you think about what's going on in, in Arkansas? So it, we were there together that night, and it was one of the great confusing nights of our lives. And we were both off camera looking at each other saying, how do we get out of this? Yeah. <laughs> and at one point, Tim remembered me trying to make a quick break, and I came back with a mouthful of saltine crackers in my mouth. And that's probably the only time I made sense all night long, by the way. <laughs> I'd never been through anything like that, and thank God the country is not going through it again. Uh, and it was kind of the beginning of the unraveling, I thought, of the American political system as we had grown up with it, that was drifting off into many, many parts. We're all looking at Tuesday of this next week, for example, and President Obama's got a world of troubles. Uh, I was just looking at a Harvard poll today. He's now losing the millennials, the young people, the white millennials. There's still a racist divide. And, but he's dropped down to under 50% in the millennials who don't think he's taking care of them with education costs, with job training. They don't like Obamacare. This is, uh, this is gonna be a tough election for him. On the other hand, the Republicans are coming into office with no grand plan about what we do. So for the next two years, we'll have a protracted run for the White House and not much done in Congress. You know, Wednesday morning, Rubio, Cruz, uh, Santorum, Jeb Bush is now looking more like a candidate than he has in recent months. They'll be out there getting ready to run again. And on the Democratic side, you've got Hillary, obviously, but Jim Webb taking a look at it and some of the other governors taking a look at it because the landscape now is moving in a lot of different directions and who knows, my favorite theory of politics is the UFO theory. The unforeseen will occur, and something might happen between now and, um, and the next election. A lot of Democrats are already saying, um, you know, we're gonna lose the Senate, and they'll go nuts to the right, and then we'll get the White House back. Republicans are saying, we've gotta learn some lessons from the past, and we've got to get our act together. I have a very prominent, Republican strategist, who's no longer as active as he once was, but I'm telling you, he was, he was in the thick of it all. I asked him recently, what's your best outcome? He said, Mitch McConnell gets beat, we still win the Senate, because they think that some of the leadership in the Republican Party has to be set aside. So the next two years are gonna be not great for the country necessarily, but it's gonna be rock and roll in the political arena. So you don't foresee any chance of Obama trying to salvage some legacy domestically? It's pretty Self tough. It's tough. It's, you know, you've got two years left. They know that. Mm -hmm. uh, you really don't have the full two years. You know, you've got 16 months, maybe. And you run out the and clock. They're already, you read the papers today that Kerry and Hagel are not happy with how they can't fit in there. Um, he, you know, he's getting, it, it seems to me, when he's talking about the uh, Ebola quarantine practice, he seems angrier than he's been in some time. This is not unusual for a president in the second term. You may remember that uh, George Bush, 43, in his second term, uh, Hank Paulson was trying to hold the economy together. And the, the president went to him at one point and said, I'd like to help you, but I'd do you more harm than good if I stepped in at this point. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, it's, it's a tough, tough business. And they take the measure of you very quickly. You can be the chief executive and the commander in chief and live in the White House, but if you don't have the underpinning of power and support, you don't have a lot to play with. 
The president came in in 2008 with a resounding victory, came in with a huge majority in, in the House, a big majority in the Senate, filibuster proofs for some time. Then in 2010, the GOP goes and wins 63 seats, and we seem to have been in this perpetual sort of trench warfare uh, where the big idea is that the country was so changed, one could say, well, some change did occur, it was too much change too quickly. Ultimately, from six years in, as we go into these last two years, which seem to be a lame duck, where do, you, where do you fall in the sense of, do you think this was a Republican opposition from the beginning? Does the president have poor relations with Congress? Do you think there's a defining sort of thing that is, it is, is stuck to Obama during his uh, term so far? Well, look, I don't think it's one thing. I do think there are lessons in all of this, and one is the lesson of President Obama, brilliant man, obviously a charismatic campaigner with an extraordinarily well-organized campaign, running against, in the first instance, John McCain, who was not the strongest candidate, in my judgment. I mean, he has all kinds of other qualities, but as a presidential candidate, when we were in the, in the depths of the recession, he didn't have a lot to say about it and how he was going to handle it. But this president had no managerial experience. He'd not run anything before. He'd been a state senator, and he'd been a community organizer, and he'd been uh, somebody who had been extraordinarily successful in getting elected to the Senate, but he hadn't been there very long. And he's made clear over the last six years that he's just not crazy about the political process. If you read those accounts of when he lost the debate to George Romney the first time, to Mitt Romney the first time in Denver, you go back and look at the preps, he said at one point to, the, uh, to his team that was preparing, he said, you know, guys, this is not who I am. Well, that's what presidents have to be. And I thought it was symbolic when he won that election, he wanted to reach out to Congress. He took the people he wanted to talk to, the Jefferson Hotel for dinner, take them to the White House. I've never <laughs> seen anybody walk in there that their knees didn't buckle, you know, whoever, whatever side of the political spectrum they were on. And he's had a small, well-contained group around him, national security and domestic affairs. Uh, you know, no one wants a president to fail, Republican or Democrat. That's not good for the country. But once there's blood in the water, you know, then what happens is that everything is unleashed. So I think the next two years are going to depend not just on what happens on the Republican side and on the Democratic side or at the White House. It's going to depend on all of us. Where's the country in all of this? These are issues that go beyond just conventional politics. I've said this in public before, and I'll say it again. You know, I didn't think that the Tea Party was good for the country because they were too narrowly cast and they were not interested in any compromise. But as a longtime political reporter, I was deeply impressed by their organizational skills. They got angry. They got organized. They stayed on message, and they stayed in the fight. They're not going to have a great year this year. But they rose up from the ranks, and they then wanted to take their place on the political field. And we need more of those citizen kinds of movements if you're going to change things, whether it's in the Republican Party or in the Democratic Party. In the last few minutes here before I open it up to questions from the audience, so if you have a pressing question, start thinking about it now. That's your gift from me. Give you sort of a Barbara Walters type of question here. And I, 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 I like to eat. Yeah, yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah, if you were any animal. Um, <laughs> through your entire career, is there a story that haunts you the most to this day? You know, it's interesting. I've never been asked the haunting question. I've been asked the question about, um, you know, the most memorable interviews and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the haunting question for me is what I see when I go to the third world. And my wife has a project going now in Malawi, one of the poorest countries in Africa, one of the poorest continents. And uh, I see the goodwill of the women who are running a canned tomato project is what it is. And uh, she... Those of you who know her know how remarkable she is, but she went over there on some other project, loves doing the kind of things that, she, that she, we grew up with in the Midwest, and she saw all these tomatoes, and they, were, they didn't have anything to do at the end of the season. They didn't know what to do with them. They didn't have any preservation, any canning of any kind. So she went back, shipped over, sold some property. Her dad had left her in South Dakota, shipped over containers of canning equipment, organized some women, went to Africa, and I went back with her. And this is a very, very difficult country. I've been all over Africa, about as poor as it gets. And she had organized a cooperative of these women, and some of them were great in the field, others were good at managerial stuff. 
but they were just a speck against all of this degradation of who they were and the AIDS that had, that had infected their country and the corruption at the top. And those are the stories that haunt me, is that you know, where the rest of us in the West are moving with Silicon Valley and medical advances and all the other changes that are coming in our lives, and there's so many people in the world who are just stuck in place, and they have real skills, and they have real intuition. These women, if you turn Africa over to the women, just said, men don't have leadership positions anymore. Women are gonna run the continent. We'd be a hell of a lot better off. <laughs> That's true. And, it, and, and you bring that up, and it's important, because I think it, it, this point should be made. It's difficult to cover that story, because there's not a lot of appetite in the United States. There's an yeah. instant sort of reaction that we have our own problems, and we have our own things that are depressing. Don't depress us anymore. So there's a real challenge of, of being a journalist to sort of get that point of view out there into the mainstream. Well, it is, and the Ebola crisis is a perfect example of that. The real Ebola crisis is not in Texas or in this country, quite honestly. I mean, we. You know, we, we've got to have systems for dealing with it. It's indisputable. But we really have had, what, one person die in Texas at this point, a couple of people quarantined. Uh, and we've got all of these great agencies that are swarming all over it. I'm on the board of the Mayo Clinic, and the Mayo system is now in a complete overhaul of what they're going to do about infectious diseases, closing down ICUs to make them into isolation units, which, which may never be used. But in West Africa, you know, you've got brave young Western doctors going in there and just trying to contain it in some fashion in these really remote villages. And that's, that's the really tough issue, frankly, that we're gonna be dealing with. And it's hard for, I think Americans have compassion fatigue. And I, I understand that. You know, we're in our third war. We've spent so much more money in, in Iraq and in Afghanistan than uh, President Bush and especially Dick Cheney and, Don Rumsfeld told us that we were, we were, it was going to be profitable, they were saying. And then we spent a trillion dollars, you know, in the first year and a half that we were over there. And it's unending at this point. So I think that people are here withdrawing from the idea that they have an obligation to the world. And they're worried about their children. And if, if you'll permit me this, the American dream is still there, but we probably have to kind of reconstituted. The American dream was always seen in economic terms. My parents were perfect examples. Their dream was that I would go to college and I would have a more economic security and a kind of grander life. They had a wonderful life, the two of them, but they, they could not have imagined the life that I would have or that Meredith and I would have. But we had it, and that was the American dream, that every generation would leave, live better than the last generation. But we're kind of hitting the ceiling on it. How many houses can you have? You know, and, and uh, do you have the kind of working class job that my dad had, and does that pay for the house that, you're, that you'd like to have? Uh, and so we have to th rethink what is the American dream. And the American dream ought to be about other kinds of opportunities and how we come together and, and what the government and other social agencies that are non-governmental can do for you. I'll take 15 seconds and tell you about, well, I'll take longer. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> Well, my, one of my grand hopes, and we are kind of have it underway. I would reconstitute public service in America. I'd make it a public-private enterprise. I'd create six public service academies in land-grant schools across the country, and I would have them both governmental and private sector. John Deere fellows, for example, in agronomy and the operation of sophisticated uh, farming equipment and water systems. Johnson & Johnson fellows, postgraduate work in infectious diseases, nurse technicians, whatever. GE fellows and small power systems around the world. And these people come in and get the special training. The, tax, the companies get a tax break and the kids get paid well. And they're assigned domestically as well as internationally. Domestically because when we have a national disaster, we send in the National Guard. Well, that National Guard unit may have been in Afghanistan twice already. And they're not necessarily well trained to do this kind of thing. And then we'd give, it seems to me, the younger people, the millennials, a reason to care about their country and some hope that they would get a skill set out of that. I think we need a big idea is what I think, uh, uh, as much as anything. So I would hope that we can, we're trying to gin this up and begin a pilot program at, at Arizona State and maybe it's something that can excite the country again. 
We don't have many things out there that are exciting folks right now. Going through the cross tabs on the point of the American. Well, let's give the Brokaw plan. Oh, you're running for president. No, yeah. um, <laughs> going through the cross tabs in our latest state polling, what I found interesting on your point about the American dream is we're talking so much about ISIS and Ebola and all these different issues, but the number one job in all of these, uh, number one issue in all these states was job creation and which candidate can, can help me there. And then number two is breaking gridlock, which are sort of two things the media does not talk about that much in, in the context of coverage. And on your point about the American dream, do you think we're doing enough uh, as journalists covering the real income inequality that exists now in the United States, at levels we have never not seen, and the ongoing poverty that is occurring in the United States uh, at, at historic levels? No, I don't, um, and I don't, we're not gonna, turn back to happy days where mom stays at home and dad goes off to work and you know you can afford everything. I grew up in that environment, you know. My mother did work because she wanted to work, but she didn't really have to, but it did give us the added advantage. But almost every friend that I had, and they were a lot of them were quite poor, the mom stayed home and the dad was working. And now, you know, the mom may have two jobs and uh, there are more single mothers out there, which is another issue. And, and the dad doesn't have the job that paid the kind of benefits that he got before. Um, and a lot of that is economic reality. There's no question about it. But the disparity between the people at the very top in corporations and what the working class get down you know, in the middle of the, it's quite extraordinary. Now, truth in advertising, I get paid a lot of money. I get that. I understand that. I like it. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, I have enough of a working class background that I think, yeah, there's a huge difference between what I'm earning and what these wonderful people that I work with, the technicians and the editors and the others are getting as well. We've, we've opened up all these big gaps between the earning and, and then it becomes the goal to have the house that costs so much money. You can't imagine what's going on in Manhattan right now. Real estate has gone nuts. I mean, all of our working class people in the building are living farther and farther and farther out because they can't afford anything in the city. Foreign money is pouring in. One apartment is sold the other day now. It was in the 90th floor somewhere for $97 million. Oh. You look at a pied de which is a small apartment in New York. It's got $2 million, nothing less than that. And, you know, and this, it seems to me, feeds unrest. And it's not just Manhattan but it's the ever more crowded urban areas around America in which this is going on. There could be more renters going on, and we're, we're, in a, we're in a seismic shift about what expectations are. Unemployment is coming down, but they're not great jobs. You know, there are a lot of service jobs. So how we solve that is kind of beyond my ability to, to, to nail it. Before we open it up to questions from the audience, I'll give you my last question. Who and we'll, we'll keep this to deceased individuals. Who is the deceased individual that you interviewed throughout history that you found the least impressive? <laughs> well, there are a lot of them. I mean, I... <laughs> uh, there are a lot of them. I, I, I remember I went down to, when Columbia was trying to change from being a cartel effectively to being a new democracy. I, and we made a lot of them where you should go down there. And I opened with a question of the guy and he absolutely went blank. He couldn't even talk for about 40 seconds. And I looked at this public relations guy and he said, I don't know what we're gonna do. And I said, <laughs> I said we've spent a lot of money to come down here and interview this guy. Um, you know, um, there were people that, and Tim and I used to talk about them here in Washington, who were not as prepared as they thought they would be. I'm not picking on him because he's had certainly enough of his self-induced trouble. John Edwards was not as good as he thought he was. You know, he, <laughs> he, was, he would show up and he was slick and he was a courtroom performer, but your dad nailed him when the first yeah. time he came on Meet the Press because he, he started to talk about support for Israel and he didn't have a clue, quite honestly, about what was going on. And, and the problem with interviewing now is that most of these people that you're interviewing have been so wired in a way, so pre-programmed, that you don't get the spontaneity out of them, that you don't get the stuff out of them. Uh, are we on the record or off the record here? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just tell you one Joe Biden story. <laughs> I interviewed Joe Biden. Well, I actually, 
He was, I thought Joe Biden was a great legislator. I mean, he was, you know, he was in the thick of things in the Senate. He cared about it passionately. And I was, this is at a critical time in, uh, in the Iraq war. There were a lot of claims coming out of the Pentagon that we were really training the Iraqi army and that they were gonna be, they were gonna take care of their own country and their own security. I was over there a lot and I was watching these people coming in in tennis shoes, joining the Iraqi army. And I finally said to Petraeus, how do we know who they are and where they're coming from? And he said, eh, we're kind of counting on their fellow warriors to tell us. It's not a very good vetting system. So J Joe was running the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at the time. And he, I went down to interview him and he had his team in Jordan and other places evaluating how the training program was going and they didn't think it was going very well. So I came down to interview him. And he was right on top of his topic. And this is sometimes the best part of journalism. When the interview ended, Joe, who I've known forever, turned to me as only Joe could and said, how are you and Meredith doing with menopause? <laughs> <laughs> that comes under the heading of a question I did not expect. <laughs> and I said, well, like everybody else. <laughs> and he said, God, I was blindsided by this stuff. Now, I've got my camera crew there and all my producers there and everybody. And, uh, and I said, uh, well, you know, Joe, it's been around for a while. And he said, yeah, I'm thinking about getting a federal study. I said, don't go there. <laughs> don't go there. I said, it's in every woman's magazine. Every week, you don't have to do that. Uh, <laughs> now, that was, a, for me, the quintessential Joe moment. And, and it was not... It was not that he was unprepared for the topic at hand, but he just loves to talk about whatever happens to be on his mind at that <laughs> time. Um, and there are, you know, there, there are lots of people who are, um, that are not impressed. I'll tell you about Putin. I interviewed Gorbachev, and we really did become quite close. Putin, I interviewed twice. Your mother was at the dinner that I gave for him at 21, and your dad was there as well. And your mother had just done the whole thing on the banking system in Russia and went right after him. And Wonderful he, Vanity Fair uh, article. My mother's here yeah, right now. Your mother's so here. God right. bless her. Thank you, Mother. We had, a, we had a big dinner at 21, and he never cracked a smile, did he, Marie? <laughs> the entire time. And the first time I interviewed him in Moscow, same thing. Uh, you, you, I didn't look into his eyes and see the soul of a Christian. I saw this. <laughs> Yeah, I saw this uh, a Russian nationalist who'd been a KGB agent. He was very tough and very determined. And you must remember, he was an apparatchik for most of the time that he was growing up in the KGB. He was a guy who carried out orders and worked for people who had more standing than he did. So you, know, you get these different kinds. On the other hand, the most remarkable man I interviewed under the most remarkable circumstances was Nelson Mandela. When he came out of prison, I was with him 24 hours after he'd been released. For 25 years, he'd been in prison. It was as if he had just gotten back from a trip to Zurich representing his country in some way. We were in his backyard in Soweto. He was charming. He was a, a completely versed in who, the Western media and who we were and what we were interested in. And I have a, one of my treasured pictures of the two of us are laughing as we're sitting there. I, you know, he'd never met me before, obviously, but I had a sound man who had one of these boom mics with a big fuzzy thing over it to cut down on the wind. And I said, you know, Mr. Mandela, this is not a weapon, it's a, it's a microphone. He said, well, I'm so glad to hear that. I thought it was a shotgun being pointed at me. <laughs> <laughs> we broke up in laughter and I thought that was, you know, one of the moments that, uh, that you kind of live for. You absolutely remember those, without doubt. And you used to, my, your, my father and you, you would have a descriptor you brought this up when you mentioned John Edwards. No socks for a politician. Real quickly, what did <laughs> yeah, that mean? I tell that story? It, real quickly, yeah. Okay. What does well, no socks quick mean? Quick story. Tim and I had a lot of shorthand that we talked about. And uh, there was a candidate running. I can't get too close to uh, the, the identification of a, a Democrat who was running in the Midwest. And, uh, and Tim said, how's he going to do? And I said, you know, I can make a couple calls and find out. And it was a guy who had a place in the East as well. And he kind of had gotten... Uh, infatuated with the eastern seaboard south where uh, Luke spends a lot of time on Nantucket. <laughs> and, uh, so I called one of my friends in the Midwest and I said, how's he going to do? And he said, one line, he said, he doesn't wear socks. <laughs> <laughs> and it was that summer kind of thing that you see in the eastern seaboard. You can't do that in farm country. <laughs> That's right. So that became, for Tim and me, shorthand for a candidate 
who didn't have a clue about where they were going. Right. And I'd say, how's he gonna do in Tim? I don't think he wears socks. Okay, that's all I need right. to know. And I use that to this day. It's a great descriptor for those types of candidates. So let's open it up to the audience. We have a microphone here. Shelby? Shelby Coffee, Mr. Brokaw, you delivered a wonderful eulogy for our friend Ben Bradley Repeat the at the Washington National Cathedral uh, this week. And I wondered, it was great for a cathedral. You're now in a temple of free speech. So if you had another couple of anecdotes about Ben and what it was like to be with Ben, who kind of resemble being with James Bond, we'd love to hear those. So question from Shelby there. Any more anecdotes about Ben Bradley? You obviously eulogized him yesterday in a beautiful way. Yeah, there way. were a lot that I didn't. That, that we I, couldn't do in a church. I couldn't do in a church. And we, I talked about it. I had actually left out one whole paragraph about that whole business about his profanity. And about, you know, and I, and I really had kind of euphemistically figured out how to do it. And then I kind of skipped over it. And it's just as well. But there were. A couple of stories about it. what I said was he had his own personal semaphore system, which involved various digits in his hand that he would use to express himself to people when they, when he, when they didn't when agree with him. But a, a British friend of mine had read, didn't know him, and read all of the uh, obituaries and came to me and said, "I've been reading all these obituaries of Benjamin Bradley." He said, "The profanity overstated?" I said, "Impossible." <laughs> Impossible. I really think it grew out of his war experience. I really think that we, Ben and I talked a lot about what it was like for this Brahmin Harvard graduate to be on a destroyer with kids from the farm and from the inner city and all these places. And I remember this story vividly. He was on the Philip, and they were in the thick of it in the midway. And they had a kid off on shore who was an artillery spotter for him. And he was down, he was really out there by himself in the jungle giving him Japanese locations. And they would talk to him radio clandestinely. And then the kid said, I've got to get out of here. I've got to get something. You know, I, I need a break. So they had no idea who he was. They, they sent a Zodiac in after him, pulled him out at nighttime. And Ben said, my god, he was about five foot three. He couldn't have weighed more than 120 pounds. He was some, some small town in Texas. He was our link. He was the guy who put himself way out front so that we could hit the target, and it made a huge impression on him. And then on the way home, Ben said, they all gathered on the fantail and talked about what they wanted to do when they got back. And so he was hearing aspirations and dreams he'd never heard from, uh, heard before because he, uh, how he'd grown up. And he wanted to be a journalist, but there were school teachers and farmers and all these other people. So I think it was a real education. But one of my very favorite social stories about him was that he, well, now I have another one like Ben. Here he comes out of that Brahmin background, goes to the war, goes to Paris, invents Newsweek, conducts the greatest uh, investigation, journalistic investigation, and the greatest political scandal in our nation's history. And everybody loved him at the Post. I've been in journalism for 52 years. I've never known reporters who kind of swooned around their boss the way they did there. And it was in part because of how he handled them. I was in, uh, it must have been the second year I was in Washington, and I was invited to a party, and, and uh, I got there late. I'd been at the office, and I walked in, and Meredith said to me, do you have any idea who you're seated next to tonight? And I said, no. And she said, it's Jan Morris, the writer who has just had a sex change operation. It's now <laughs> Miss Jan Morris. And I would kind of vaguely read about it. And I think, oh my god. And we're immediately seated at dinner, and she could not have been more charming. She turned to me and said, well, Mr. Broke, I've been watching you cover Watergate. How has that affected you? And I said, not thinking, it's changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm just, you know, I'm red in the face. Now, how do I get out of it? And Ben overhears this. And he bails me out. He leans over and says to her, when was the last time we saw each other? Was it in Algeria? And I thought, why can't I say something like that? <laughs> and that's who he was. I mean, he never... He was always joyful, and Woodward and I have talked about him a lot, because Bob and I come from the same kind of Midwestern Protestant guilt, and I, he, said, <laughs> he said, Ben never, ever looked back. He only looked forward. If, if they made a mistake, he'd say, okay, clean it up, and we go on. And instead of anguishing over it, he'd just say, okay, got to keep going, guys, and, and, and that's what they would do. So he was, he was really quite remarkable. 
Who else we have here in the audience? Someone want to be bold? Yeah, come right, come right on up to the uh, microphone here. Don't fall down the stairs. <laughs> oh, great. All right, let's do this. We'll come right back. That'll be great. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Is this on? Yeah. Is it on? Um, I was just wondering, so since you've retired, there's been a lot of changes in the way that journalism is presented, like the rise of the 24-hour news cycle and sort of celebrity news personalities and um, just much more controversial sort of loud personalities. I'm curious, like, what you think of um, these new personalities and the, the TV shows, perhaps, that you watch to get the news now. The question is, in our current day and age, we have this sort of uh, celebrity journalist-driven cable news machine, a lot more opinion on news, uh, not like it used to be in any capacity. So much of it derived also from the social media. What does that mean for the country? And and and. What do you watch as a media consumer these days? Well, I, I'm surprised some people. I, I, I think we have so many more choices now than we've ever had, representing so many different points of view. But you can't be a couch potato anymore. You've got to be much more aggressive as a consumer about what you watch and, and test it for its credibility. Is it good for the country? I think free expression is good for the country. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of mischief, and I think there's a lot of deliberate destructive mischief that goes on out there. So my recommendation is to audiences is kind of create, if you will, your own virtual newspaper. I get up in the morning and I, you know, I have a friend who runs the Financial Times. I like to check in, see what's going on there. I think it's a great newspaper. Then I run the traps and all the standard American uh, establishment papers. I read the Post and the, and, the, and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times right away. I go to the Council of Foreign Relations where I'm a board member. We've got a very good overnight look at what's going on. And then there are terrific websites that are attached to think tanks or to special interest groups of one kind or another. I love the idea that I can a keystroke read the Dallas Times Herald. You know, if there's something going on in Texas, I want to see what the, that paper is saying and I can get it from them. Um, so, but I have to be proactive about it. I just can't take what comes at me. We have a, a ranch in Montana and a wonderful couple working for us, but they're, you know, real ranching, isolated family in a rural area, and they're quite apolitical. And about twice a week, uh, Karen comes across the bridge, her eyes are about this big, and she'll say to me, you're not gonna believe what I read on the internet this morning. And my answer is always the same, Karen, you're right. I'm not gonna believe what you read on the internet this morning. <laughs> And you have to have that attitude a little more, I think. Now, it's a very important point is that in this day and age, everyone thinks it's easier to be a media consumer. And that's not necessarily true because you really have to separate fact from fiction when you're a media consumer and, and be much more cognizant of who's delivering you the product. Over here, what do we have? Mr. Brokaw, I really enjoy your time here this evening. And you may not remember but I had sent you some pictures previously when you were in town for the 10th anniversary of the fall of the wall. Pictures of you in Berlin, because at the time I was a young army intelligence officer and I was assigned there from December of 88 until May of 92. So this evening I brought you some additional photographs <laughs> attesting to the fact that you were there in fact. And also for the 20th anniversary I published a book but it's from the perspective of what the role the Western allies played, which really hasn't been documented in many ways. So I would be honored if you would accept this from me. And again, I enjoy the fact that you came here this evening and I had a chance this time to see you. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your service. God bless you. I mean, a young army intelligence officer who was in Berlin at the time of the fall of the wall and has just written a book about the role that Western allies had in the fall of the wall that is too often overlooked. What, what do you think about that in terms of, of certain Western allies not gotten their due diligence in terms of the fall of the wall? No, I, you know, the fall of the wall was really brought on by the people in the GDR. What, what was overlooked was what had happened in Leipzig the week before. There were hundreds of thousands of people out there demanding change. And what happened with perestroika and glasnost and the Soviet Union, it spread very quickly to the satellite states. So I give the, the generational, it was a generational change that was going on in the East. They were willing to push back and they were making it harder and harder for them to be controlled. I've 
just gotten back, as I indicated earlier, and I interviewed a number of kind of key people. There was a photographer who was clandestinely getting out video to the West to say, here's where we are, and this is what's going on, and, and we do need your help. Um, so it, it really was a revolt that came from uh, the bottom up. And that Schabowski news conference, uh, for example, uh, the East German press, which had been necessarily kind of toady-like, they were very aggressive that day, that afternoon. And they were pushing them hard on, on policies that, about the press and, and whether they would have the freedom to travel or not. And that was unusual for them. And when he made the announcement, not in my interview, but when he made the announcement in the room, it was stunning because everybody kind of nodded off at that point. He'd been droning on for an hour in triple bureaucratic fashion. Then he pulls this piece of paper out and reads it. And it seemed to us that he was saying that you could come and go through any mm -hmm. entrance. It turns out that they did have all kinds of stipulations on it. And they honestly thought in their uh, kind of uh, bewildered way of looking at the world that the East Germans would go out to the West and then return to their old lives, come back <laughs> into the East again. Get some and genes when to go left that news conference and drove out to the compound where the Politburo members all lived, they had all gone to sleep. And here, you know, their world was crumbling around them. It's a wonderful new book out by a, a Harvard historian, actually trained at, uh, at Oxford by the name of Mary Surratt called The Collapse. Now, it's a wonderful new book in part because she gives NBC great credit for how we covered the story, but also <laughs> she, she has unbelievable detail about what was going on behind the scenes. And uh, it's quite riveting. The narrative takes you all the way through it. So we're going to be doing some things at Harvard this fall with that. You have one right there? Yes, sir. Excuse me. Thank you. How do you account for the news media's failure to challenge the basis for the invasion of Iraq? How do you account for the news media's failure to challenge the basis for the invasion of Iraq? Uh, something that's got obviously a lot of, of attention paid to it. There's that Bill Moyers documentary. You know, there was uh, that. You know, that's that's a question that has been around for a while. My personal judgment: I was in there a lot beforehand. I didn't know about weapons of mass destruction, and no one really did. The UN couldn't quite figure out whether they had them or didn't have them. I was over there with the teams. Could they have been hidden? There were all these bunkers all over the country. What I did think was, and I said this on the air, was that you know, we'll be successful militarily in the short term, but then the country will begin to break up into its tribal fiefdoms, and that it's going to be a lot harder to hold it together than we knew. The State Department had another point of view about the consequences of the invasion, but never said, no, there should be no invasion. Colin Powell went to the UN and held up the little vial, or talked about the vial. Uh, so it was, when the drumbeats of war start in this country, and, they, and it was especially after 9-11, there's this kind of emotional tide. The only person who really spoke out, who had great credibility in this area, was uh, Brent Scowcroft. And we did put him on the air and had him talk about it a lot. But you were not getting much out of the Congress. A lot of people were voting for it at that time. And there was so much that was unknowable. In fact, it was six or seven months later, I was over there with David Kay, and he thought he, that they had gotten, they'd gotten so many computer printouts, he thought they were going to find the cache of weapons of mass destruction. And two weeks later, he said, they're not there. My own judgment is that, A, uh, that Saddam was trying to persuade Iran that he was prepared to fight back with weapons of mass destruction, and that his colonels and the others around him were coming up with plans, getting money for it. And I think that there are probably secret bank accounts all over uh, Zurich now with uh, money that they got for weapons of mass destruction. There was never a danger, in my judgment, of the mushroom cloud that we heard a lot about. That I was going to ask, there never seemed to be a compelling reason for us to do it now versus wait until they either came up or discovered or something. We were not threatened, the United States. So there was no direct threat. There was no impetus to do it immediately. So there was sort of a rush. No, he was in a box. I mean, I, 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 and we had him in a box. And if you, if you. Saddam and, was in a box, yeah. Yeah, at the time, you know, Rumsfeld will say, well, we couldn't take a chance because he was getting closer and closer to our overflights. That's now the revised view of it. Mm -hmm. And now Rumsfeld is saying, 
Well, you know, intelligence, uh, boy, you know, when, when um, Colin Powell went to the UN, that kind of told us what we, those were not facts, that's what passes for intelligence. So there's a lot of sliding away from it from people who were, in fact, uh, in, thought that he was a grave threat from the moment they arrived in this administration. They had them and him in their crosshairs. The other thing, having been in there a lot, uh, I, two things became very clear to me. First of all, the country is a lot more broken than they thought it was. It was gonna be really hard once we took control to try to make it work again. The second thing was that there was a complete misinterpretation about the Sunnis and the Shiite and how they, uh, how they would fight each other. It was, he was a Sunni, the Shiite, larger population. I went out to a Shiite university. This is a month before the war began and ditched my minder and had a thousand kids who were studying um, the American culture. They were listening to VOA and they were, you know, they were all about John Denver and they were, it was a graduation day. <laughs> and uh, we were having a wonderful time together. And at the end, I said to this one particularly voluble young man, so what are you gonna do now that you graduate? And his eyes went cold and he said to me, I'm gonna join Jihad and fight the United States. And I said, I'm the United States, it's not you, it's Bush. I'm gonna fight Bush. And then I went down to a souk, it was my favorite souk in, in Baghdad. It was a auto parts souk. It snaked through the heart of the city for about two miles. If you wanted a wind up for a 1948 Studebaker window, you could find one there. And they were, <laughs> They were all really tough Shiite. And I'd been there a couple of times, but now they knew me. And then they would corner me when I walked in and they'd say, you know, we don't need you telling us what to do to come in here. I said, but Saddam, Sunni. And they said, yes, but it's our country. It's not about him, it's about our country. So I came back and in my exchanges with members of the administration trying to figure out what was going on, I would say, this is what I've been hearing. Oh, Tom, they have to tell you that. I've been doing this a long time. I know when they have to tell me something and when they don't. And then they would call up people like Chalabi, who had not been there in 20 years, or other Middle Eastern experts who had been stuck in Princeton and had not been there in 20 years. These guys really know what's going on. I said, you know, not like they do on the street, it seems to me. But, and, and that went on the air. But, uh, you know, they were so determined at that point to conduct the war that they were going to go ahead anyway. And people, who had been assigned to get in there immediately after the, they got to Baghdad, including Margaret Tutwiler, who had been a principal aide to James Baker, said, we had no idea about how broken this was. Now, the State Department had issued a big paper about the enormous task of trying to put it back together again, but there was such division between the Defense Department, the Vice President's office, and the State Department that they weren't listening to each other. And on that point, uh, there's a famous Meet the Press clip of my father's interviewing Dick Cheney, and he asked the question, he goes, what if we are received not as liberators, but as occupiers? And Cheney's simple response is, well, that's not going to happen. And that was sort of the response of not only the administration, but those who backed the war in Congress on the Democratic side as well. And so the media did put that out there. I think in retrospect, probably could have been covered more thoroughly, everything in hindsight is 2020. People forget the post 9 11 mindset, but that aspect was definitely out there. Last one here, yes. The, uh, in some circles, there's the belief that the Berlin Wall came down largely because of Ronald Reagan. Uh, others don't really understand that. What's your attitude on Ronald so Reagan's involvement? This belief that the Berlin Wall came down because of Ronald Reagan. Oh. And the Pope, you could also add in there, but who, Ronald Reagan specifically. Well, they were, they were all players, and, and they all kept the pressure on. I mean, I think the enduring legacy of Ronald Reagan will be that he came in a real hawk about how to take down the Soviet Union with, the, uh, with Star Wars and all that, and then was persuaded seeing what was going on over there by, among others, Nancy, by the way, uh, and, and, and Soviet analysts, that the system was crumbling from within and that they couldn't be sustained, and we could continue to put economic pressure on them and make them spend money on SDI. And that was what Reykjavik was all about. And it was clear that they couldn't pull that off. Now, Gorbachev, who I admire, was a guy who didn't give up on communism. I mean, it's the one flaw, and that's why he, you know, he, he lost a lot of his inner circle because he wanted to keep the system in place, but he knew they would have to change. You couldn't have both. 
uh, but he was the best guy to be dealing with at that time, and we never dealt with anybody like that before. So I do think that, that Reagan and, uh, and the Pope had a role in all of this, but there are a lot of players on the other side as well who were doing smart things. Um, uh, like Valenza is a perfect example in Poland. Your dad and I were there when, when the, the president was there, and we were there when the Pope was there. And there was this enormous There's pictures movement. of you guys with him in beers, which are, are in, right. in my mom's house. It's great, yeah. We, uh, <laughs> when the Pope was there, there was a big movement uh, on the left in Poland about the church was hand in glove with the rulers. And in fact, the church was a pipeline. Uh, what, what the Pope was doing was sending messages through the Catholic hierarchy in Poland about we're not going to have blood in the streets. And they, they were, the church was very important about bringing that down peacefully. I'll tell you one quick story about Jaruzelski that some of you may remember. Um, not Jaruzelski, uh, uh, the Polish president who has just died. Uh, David Lens Ignatius, help me out with this. Uh, Lensky, Lech Walensky? Pardon me? Walensky? Yeah, it was, and, and so I had interviewed Gorbachev, and so I go to Poland and I have an interview with uh, Walensky, it was his name. Wait, who's the history man here? <laughs> anyhow, he's a man who'd also nice. kind of kept right. the lid on things. And he came into the room, and um, he was a stately career military guy in Poland, came from a distinguished family, had shaded glasses, and he said, to me, I had a producer from Chicago with me um, who was a kind of unmade bed of a man, had a hilarious sense of humor. And uh, Wences said to me, uh, I've been interviewed by Walter Cronkite, translation, yes. And I've been interviewed by Barbara Walters. I've been interviewed by the editor of the New York Times. Now I'm about to be interviewed by the most important American journalist of all because I just interviewed Gorbachev. Mr. Tom Brokaw, and before I could respond, my producer said, oh my God, no wonder this guy's in so much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. One last one to end the night on, and thank you so much for coming, everybody. You've been a wonderful audience. Just, and you know, we're gonna get this flight out of here on time. Real quickly, one reason for optimism for the future in the United States and the biggest reason for pessimism that keeps you up at night for the future of the United oh, States. Well, a big reason for optimism is that we're the most inventive country in the world and people are still desperate to come here and bring all their skills with them. I've been dealing with some health issues for the last year and um, at a hospital in New York, I have yet to meet a native born American and these are the best caregivers that there are. All the scientists and all the people who are working up and down the corridors have come here from everywhere from China and from Russia and from South America because this is where they want to live and where they can exercise the skills that they have developed over the years. That's just a snapshot of how we are constantly renewing this American dream. There's no other immigrant nation in the history of the world like what we have. And we need to figure out how we're gonna deal with immigration and how we can keep that going on, it seems to me. The reason for pessimism is the withdrawal of people from taking an active role in their own destiny. Uh, I think there's something going on. I, I can't codify it completely, but I think that there's such a rejection of Washington that federalism, as we have known it and is important to us, is in some peril. If you go around the country, we have become a country of urban nations. Seattle is an urban nation. It has its own culture, its own economy, it has its own trade policies with the Pacific Rim. And it's a place where there's such vibrancy in terms of getting things done and the political system at the municipal and county level works quite well. In San Francisco, it's kind of still dysfunctional, but it's a throbbing place, that metropolitan area with great universities and medical systems and, and the money that's coming out of Silicon Valley is really recharging it. What's the mantra in Silicon Valley? Be disruptive, find new ways to do things. You know, don't be afraid. Los Angeles is an urban nation. It's South American urban nation. Texas, it's an energy urban nation with what they've got going on. You move across the country. It's true in all of these big metropolitan areas which are getting ever larger every year. Atlanta, Miami, all the way up the Eastern seaboard. 
not quite as true yet in as far north as it is in the west where there's constant renewal going on. But these are big seismic shifts in the country that will have consequences, it seems to me. Tom Brokaw, living legend, huh? journalist is really important and we take it seriously but I'm also the luckiest guy that I know I've you know I grew up in small towns in South Dakota as a working class kid and I wanted to have the kind of life that I have never realizing I would have the opportunities that I do and trust me when you get to know me you won't give me standing applauses as much as <laughs> thanks a lot everybody have a great Halloween yeah. Come home from the heart.